Hey guys, welcome to the Community Plains Podcast. I am your host, Harley Harrison, and today I have two very, very special guests. So if you would like to introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Peter Thompson. I'm COO and co-owner of the Endpoint Group, so Endpoint Esports. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Jamie Sykes. I'm a business development executive for the Endpoint Group, and I also run our Practrums brand as well. Very interesting. So, so Pete, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself just to start off with? Sure. Um, I guess from an esports gaming side, I've been a gamer all my life. Um, I was I used to play Counter Strike as a kid, growing up. Um, played it at a semi professional level in Counter Strike Source, which is not Counter Strike Two, which it is now. But um, and yeah, I kind of uh, after after going to uni and before that, I, was, I played poker poker professionally for twelve years, and then um, got back into gaming. And found a career in gaming, and I love it. And just doing a different, just something different every day, and um, it's more of a, a passion thing, which I've turned into a business. Really. Do you ever wish that sometimes maybe you played as a professional player and didn't do what you do now, or would you do you like what you do now? Um, I mean, it's a cool dream to have, isn't it? Yeah. But at the same time, I'm I'm happy with what I'm doing now. I don't. I I, th- I think uh, the player life is a difficult one, and it's a short career. And it's, I don't know, yeah, I would have enjoyed it as well, no doubt. And I think it's, it would be nice every now and then to take a break from everything and go, oh, I'll play yeah. games for a living. Yeah. That sounds like a really fun thing to do. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't miss not doing it, if that makes sense, or, yeah. or whatever, but yeah. But you couldn't really make a living back when I was doing it. You, yeah. you play for fun, you might make a few hundred quid here and there, but you can get a full time job. So, how times have changed. Yeah, exactly. Some, yeah, some yeah. people now, I think, look at it and, overlook it a little bit I think we need a bit more recognition of it, especially with the older generation as well um, so Jim would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself as well yeah um, so pretty similar to Pete honestly uh, I started out playing Call of Duty um, semi-professionally back then the scene was a lot smaller so you could be better at the game there uh, and still be quite high up in the, in the rankings uh, quickly realised uh, when we played for the uh, qualifiers for uh, the world championship in like 2014 that I was never going to be good enough when we got obliterated out of the world championship run um, by a, a team called Orbit um, so I ended up taking a bit of a hiatus went through all education doing all the kind of things a teenage guy does when you know they have nothing on in their life um, how you know partying and stuff like that when I got to university COVID hit so I went back into uh, esports through the university side uh, ran our collegiate side for Sheffield Hallam for a good few years and then as I was sort of on the tail end of university, the vacancy with Endpoint opened up um, and I ended up joining Endpoint. The short version of this story ended up joining Endpoint and progressing through their ranks there. So, yeah. Look at, yeah, again, just look, looking back, say you're, you're in your old kid body, would you ever imagine you was in this kind of business of work or anything like that? I mean, I always wanted to be. Growing up, I used to consume a lot of content from, from Optic. They were kind of my childhood heroes from an esports perspective. So... I always hoped that I would be able to emulate what they were doing at some point, and I guess to a lesser degree now, I'd have the opportunity. I work in esports professionally. I make my own content and things, you know, vlog my life in esports. Um, I get to work with some huge heavyweights from various organizations, people who, you know, you aspire to work with as a child, and then you end up actually working with them. You have to uh, sometimes um, dial back the enthusiasm when you meet someone who's really cool and you don't want to show the, um, play your hand to too openly so I'm actually in a side I'm buzzing to meet you but I'm going to pretend that I'm really cool we're on the same level now yeah. we're no longer I'm not a fan we are colleagues we are peers <laughs> so yeah obviously just talking about obviously idols and things like that when when you were both young what was like a kind of game that you enjoyed obviously Call of Duty for you I'm guessing CSGO so yeah I never really played CSGO oh, I was CSGO in... 1.6 the source <laughs> Go was not out when I was when I was playing okay Go was, Go, it's probably Counter Strike's been going for 20, <laughs> 25 years or something now, or whatever it is. See, I'm, um, I'm, I'm more of a Call of Duty yeah. side of things. Yeah, man. that's yeah. it. Well, the, the primary FPS right there. Yeah, see, it's Re- <laughs> Rebirth <laughs> Island. I played Mod 4 as well, and I played. Oh, uh, you played Pro Mod, bro. You played yeah. Cow, 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 yeah, Keyboard and Mouse Call of Duty. It's fake Call of Duty. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, obviously, in school and university, was there was like any one big challenging thing that you had to overcome and now looking back at it you think wow I, I did a good job there is there anything like in particular university for me was um, I'll be honest I went to university to make friends and kind of just have a uh, enjoy it 
and if I got a degree at the end of it, great. Um, I was already playing poker throughout the whole of that anyway, and paying for my whole university, university through that. Um, actually, from that, for the first two and a half years, I'll be honest, I didn't really do much work. Um, and for the last six months of my university, I really worked actually hard and I have, I have on my dissertation. And I do think that taught me a lot in terms of like trying to achieve something. The dissertation didn't really matter what the subject was. I kind of just, in, I quite liked that process. And I think I actually just kind of, it helped me be more um, self-motivated and just kind of, uh, you know, a regimented day and all that kind of side of things. And well, university itself just taught me life skills, I think, which was yeah. which was important for me. The course itself, I was, it was kind of rubbish, but yeah. Um, yeah. So would you say you work well under pressure than I'm getting from that? I've always been quite a good like pro problem thinker and um, like problem solver and, and making sure that kind of you, you think about a whole scenario in every every angle. I think poker taught me that a lot. Yeah. Um, I actually played tennis growing up as well, which is like kind of trying to beat your opponent. Yeah. And I think poker also helped with that from the mental side and figuring out how to beat your opponent and figuring out every angle of what's what's kind of going on. And it's the same in business. You've kind of, kind of got to think every scenario and make sure you don't like open yourself up to mistakes or, um, and if you do make mistakes, that's fine, but you just learn from them and, and make sure you don't make them again. And just, yeah. But you can only get that kind of stuff through experience and I've still got a lot to learn. And, you know, in the next five, 10 years, I'll say something different probably. And, yeah. you know, it's just kind of figuring that out, but yeah. Do you reckon that that, that specific skill set is good within the esports industry? Well, yeah, I 100%. I, I think I think players need it as well, let alone if you're, if you're working in it or, or anything. But, you know, um, again, so taking the poker analogy or the tennis analogy, it's like improving your mental state for that helps being a professional player as well. You know, that, that if I was to play Counter-Strike now compared to me playing it as a kid, my mental state is actually so much stronger in terms of no rage, no, don't get angry in certain areas if you, if you make mistakes or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't. Maybe if Jamie makes a huge mistake and it costs us a lot of business, but no, I, I, I don't anyway, but no, um, there's, um, I generally pretty, pretty level-headed, I think. And I think that's um, like, I think that's a, an attribute that everyone needs in esports. And it's a long-term play. Like the esports industry is growing and growing, but it's not quite there yet still. And if you're not in it for the long term, you shouldn't be in it really. Yeah. Because if you're trying to get a quick buck or something in the next year or next, as soon as you get into it, then it's not really the market you should be in it. You should be in it because you enjoy it still. That's why I think esports communities were so much better back when I was playing because everyone was in it because they enjoyed it and loved it, not for the money. Yeah. Now some people get into it for the money, but it, that shouldn't be what it's about. It's yeah. about doing it because you love it and day to day. And and yeah, maybe everyone makes a career out of it in the, in the end, but yeah. yeah. See, one, one, I have a very strong opinion on that and like the whole idea of, say, Fortnite, for example, we know that's a very big game at the minute and the competitive side of that is kids younger than me are playing it every single day to try and get better to earn the money so they don't have to go and get a normal everyday job like a trades or anything. And I think my opinions on that is that that's not how it should be. So if you want to get in it, to, in it professionally, I reckon don't spend every day of every minute and there needs to be that kind of balance. Between. There, there, there definitely needs to be a balance, but at the same time, it's the same as a sports like Sheffield United football yeah. players. Do you think they spent every day playing football on a pitch as a kid yeah. growing up to try and be a professional player? Yes, they did. Exactly. And only 0.001% of people will make it. Like it's the same in esports. There's there's millions, hundreds of millions of Fortnite players out there, and only like this very small percentage of probably like hundred to two hundred people will actually make a really good living from it. Like yeah. so, the odds are way stacked against you. So I agree, you need a backup plan. Yeah. But at the same time, if you want it, you need to work for it. So it's yeah, yeah hard, but. So Jamie, just similar similar question there. Is there anything like from like your university or school life that you had to overcome and like you're really proud of? Yeah, I mean, I'll be completely honest. Like at primary school was um, you know absolutely horrendous. Um, like very lonely in primary school. Didn't uh, really uh, didn't really make friends very well when I was younger. Got to like teenage years. I was the the esports YouTube guy, and that wasn't a bad thing because like everybody wanted to do it. So like. I was friends with everyone at school because everybody wanted to do what I was doing. Everybody bought capture cards for Xboxes. Everybody bought PCs. Everyone was making content. Um, but I sort of pioneered right in our high school, I guess. And then obviously everyone grew up and I didn't. I ended up working at it full time. Um, university and college, college was great. Loved college. Went to Barnes College. Shout out Barnes College. Great place. We had a really good time. We had really good tutors. Um, university. Didn't really enjoy university. I went more out of um, same same sort of reason as Pete. Went for like a good time more than anything. I wanted a degree and I was going to work hard. 
but I'm very much financially motivated. So when I started working part time, and I could make money from working part time hours and not going to my lectures, I would rather go and make money than go and sit and spend an hour, two hours listening to some old gamer tell me about marketing strategy. Yeah. So uh, I decided to go and go down that route. And you know, ultimately, you know, these days you can learn a lot of what I did on my degree just from listening to the right people in business on podcasts and, on, and you know their their articles they've written. Um, there's fantastic articles out there from from people uh, in business who you know start like Stephen Bartlett and Gary Vaynerchuk and people like that who do really great um, educational stuff. So yeah, university. You know, I started putting some effort in right at the end because I need to get out of it more than anything. I was actually I lied to this guy, tell him I'd already got my degree and started Let's working. See if he's got a degree. Don't <laughs> I uh, I genuinely did thought in I I will explain this. I thought I had passed the degree. I had all the information back. Everything was good to go, and then right at the last push, they said actually it failed one module. Um, so I'd already started working for Endpoint when I found out, so I had to reset the module. So the year afterwards, my first full year in Endpoint, I was still sitting my degree. Um, one module, like a couple of hours a week, got that out of the way, got past that, had my graduation. So yeah, um, university not completely necessary these days. Yeah. I think there's a lot, a lot of pressure externally from educators to put people into university because it's good for them, good for numbers, good for metrics. But if you don't want to go, um, there are so many opportunities out there now. I'm sure, pretty sure there's like degree apprenticeships where you get the degree and get to put a wage in your pocket. Something like that would have been ideal for me if it had existed when I had the opportunity. But um, I was pushed into university by external people. And although you know I don't regret it because I've got the degree and it looks good on paper, I wouldn't necessarily tell people you have to go to university to succeed in life. Yeah, I think I just on the degree thing. I think um, when we look at a CV, I don't really care about a degree too much. But the only reason why a degree, oh, <laughs> the, only, the only reason why a degree, like I probably didn't even look if you had one to be honest, but like the only reason why a degree can be a good thing to put on there is that you've shown somebody has committed three or four years of their life on something and they finished the project. Whereas um, if you often you'll find people that start something and, fin and don't finish it all the time and that's the same in, in work like if you have an employee who, who likes to start a job and will get 20 30 40 percent done and then just give up or, or go on to the next thing and do and they, they flit around too much you never get anything done because everything no, nothing's finished and i think university or even a college like b-tech or any or apprenticeship i think is a great idea but um all these things just show you can complete something and you actually can see something to the end that's that's yeah. the only thing that I, I i really care about it and then the rest of it is just an interview and finding out about the person and, and their experience outside of university or you know i've gone and helped out here 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 or whatever and uh, i've got this experience is, is more important anyway but yeah yeah so obviously with you being being high up if someone was coming to look for a job at endpoint like what would you mainly look for um at endpoint we would never um oops, sorry, we'll go. Go. At, at endpoint we would never we don't if someone like we get people reaching out to us all the time obviously we don't say yeah cool of course you can have a job we, we when we hire for a job we make sure that we hire publicly so we get hundreds of people out applying and we find the right person because if you if you hire your friends or hire the odd person that reaches out off most of the time we find out it doesn't work out really so we just make sure that we do a large application process give everyone a fair chance as well to apply in a certain period of time you have weeks to apply for example so you can put some good work into it and um and then we find we find the best person for us as well through that process. Yeah. So that that's the way we do it. But I, I've always said to people that, um, you know, you have these kind of some of these courses can be quite broad, but we would only hire for a niche. So, like, if we're like, if you look at our job titles we have currently, we've got uh, well, business development, but started as social media. So social media concentrating was a niche, or marketing really. Yeah. So marketing is a big niche. You don't necessarily need to do esports to know marketing actually if you have a marketing degree and you like gaming is kind of more actually relevant anyway yeah uh, and then you've got graphic design the person needs to be very good at graphic design doesn't really matter they've got a degree but you, you see their portfolio is all that matters really yeah and the way they work video editing need to be good at video editing you have um you might have a team manager but i'll be honest i don't think the um the industry isn't really there to support that many of them right now, unless it's like a tier one top kind of like organizations. Um, so there's not many jobs there. Uh, we also have videographer, uh, videographer content manager. Um, we've got head of events. So event production is important as well on that and, and, and kind of like 
organizing yourself again they're niche areas we, we pick it's not a, an overall jack of all trades really um that that's a rare role i'd say in esports so if you I, my advice would be find something you really love doing and just stick to that yeah. if you want to like just get your way in to start with you can broaden yourself out afterwards jamie's broadened himself out afterwards he started in marketing but now he does a lot more in business development and finding and, and being more more of a stuff so start somewhere get your foot in grow from there yeah but go for a niche to start with what is what i'd say well on about just like different roles within the company and things i feel like and i know a lot of people kind of overlook coaches of your pro players and stuff and like would you like to just a little, explain a little bit about like how your coaches do what they how they work around with players and things like that yeah coaches uh, we pick up coaches based off well recommendations for a start uh full in view process making sure they've got the right mindset which is very important um they work from an analytical standpoint often statistical based in some games kind of like Moneyball if you ever watch Moneyball the film go watch it if you haven't um, a lot of esports is going that way in terms of statistics uh, or we've been doing it for years anyway it's a good way to scout um, it's a great analogy for, for endpoint Moneyball you've got the rich teams you've got the poor teams and you've got us we have to come up really hard and have to work really hard to beat up there with the, other, with yeah. the big guys it's a great analogy Moneyball is like a explanation for endpoint in esports no yeah. yeah but it, but it's also but we've been a profitable company and these top ones haven't yeah they, they're starting to do it as well mm. because they have to um and i think yeah in terms of what they do from day to day yeah it's managing the team in some ways because again a team manager isn't always there because that's a job which is hard to fund um unless it oversees everything but um yeah they stay talking with the team being on practice going on with scrims listening to comms uh, talking through issues one on one with the players as well. You need to be very skilled or very knowledgeable at that game specifically. Don't go. I can do. Uh, we have get people reaching out to us all the time saying, "I I, I can be a coach for your Counter Strike team. Your uh, let's do Rainbow Six. Let's do Quake. I can do Rocket League. I know a little bit about Valorant as well." We're never going to hire that person. Yeah. We'd always go hire the person who we think is the best at Counter Strike and knows Counter Strike down to a T. Um, and and so yeah the players the, one of the most important things we've struggled with is that players need to be able to respect the coach so if you've got someone who's coming in with no experience into like a decent team you don't generally find the players don't respect the coach and then it never works out so you need that person who's got no experience needs to get the experience through the smaller teams to start with to get to a level where they get respected by the players and then it's a mutual respect for everyone yeah. uh, and, then, and then you're in a team environment where you're working together and then so on but you need that level of respect which um, so they can work one on one with someone and they'll actually listen to them yeah yeah so we, we touched on a little bit of like the business side there with obviously the different teams and like the hierarchy of teams and stuff so uh, on the business side of it if you could give anyone suggestions to someone who wants to get into the esports side of business what would those suggestions be do you reckon to get into esports as, as a career do you mean uh career progression into esports yeah so if say if i wanted to get into the marketing side of yeah the esports what kind of suggestions and ways should i go about that I mean, I'm a firm, firm believer, and I'll tell everybody to volunteer. And people will then ask me, well, how do I find voluntary positions? If you go out there and look on social media, particularly Twitter, you will find hundreds of what we call, not disrespectfully, but they are smaller organizations, bedroom organizations that are run out of people's homes. Yeah. Friends start organizations, people meet people and start you know, businesses together. Some of them do really well, some are pretty successful, but those guys don't have the capital to be paying staff, um, just truthfully. So they're always looking for people to volunteer. And if you go and spend that time and get that experience and you can show, for example, I did it with a really small team in Call of Duty. I went away and generated a couple of thousand pounds in, in sponsorship money. I went and did you know 350% growth on social media. Tangible facts I can put on a resume and then I hand it over to a big team like Endpoint and say, well, actually, look at what I've done here. Like with zero, with zero resources, zero paid media, with, uh, with no budget, I've managed to create all of this like look what I could potentially do for you guys with the resources you've got um, it's something people look at and people think that, okay yeah we'll give this guy a chance or at least get you in the door for an interview and then you can sell yourself on everything else um, so yeah don't overlook the power of volunteering don't get taken advantage of um, because people will try and get as much work out of you for as little as possible but if you've got a spare few hours I was working um, in retail I'd do Free while 10 p.m. as a supervisor in a supermarket. I drive home because my house was in Sheffield because I was living at the university. I drive home. I had to really get in a meeting, like a, a staff meeting at 11 p.m. with all the org staff. We talk about what we're doing for the evening. 
um, what we've been working on, uh, catch up on there. Um, and yeah, then I'd be like, you know, I'd go to bed and start all the next day. University, uh, university, sorry, yeah, university work, volunteering at the evening to try and get myself out there. And it ended up paying off in the end. Yeah. So yeah, people have to, um, if you want it, you will find a way. People are very lazy and like think people will hand them things on a plate and it's not how it works. You have to find it yourself. You have to work hard for it. Yeah, I think just on the volunteer side, I mean, I've, I've got different views on volunteering. I think it's, we do it, we class it as work experience for like a week or two. We don't like to do, oh, come work for us for three, three, six months for free. We would never do that. I think it's just taking advantage, but I agree. There are some people that need to do that at the start. Fair enough. Um, just always kind of have it in your mind or at least discuss with the person so you're all open-minded that you know what you're getting out of it exactly and no one's going to be like a month down the road saying where's my pay or, or where's my whatever or where's what you know it doesn't work otherwise but from the marketing side yeah so our first ever employee actually was um, a woman called Ree she's great and we hired her as a social media manager to start with she's now our head of marketing um, the reason why we employ employed her she had no background in esports actually she liked playing League of Legends but um, which wasn't even a game of ours but the um she she was working at a tattoo shop called Blue Banana and um, she started their Instagram account by herself as just a, a, as an employee, got a few thousand followers, posts every day. That for us was the initiative to go, oh, she she does it off her own back. She doesn't need to do this. It's not part of her job role. She's, she's gone beyond what she needs to do anyway and has got that kind of like, um, that flair to it, uh, the kind of imaginary flair, whatever it is. The, uh, yeah. And that's why we hired her for that reason so yeah as Jamie said kind of just um, go out your way to, to do something get a few thousand followers create some actual engagement for a brand or something or improve that and bring that to your that's quite important to put on a CV not that you work there that you work there but you did this for them and, and so on but yeah so you, you both like touched on like obviously like followers and like posting things and if, if you were in social media as well would you guys think that having a good following and having a, maybe a fan base in a sort of way is a good thing to have nowadays. So maybe if I was on TikTok with a few thousand followers or Facebook, Instagram with a few thousand followers, would you say that's like a bonus in life right now? 100%, I said I say to everyone who's like in the, in the college degrees or university degrees or whatever, while you're doing education especially and you're not, you don't have to necessarily pay bills like rent and, and your day to day when you get an adult life kind of thing and you can maybe live at home when you're doing it under your parents, that's the time where you should be you, you, in your spare time do content build a brand for yourself get connections within the industry when you don't have to worry about getting getting a, a, a thousand quid here or through the door to get to pay for bills you know when you don't have to worry about the money is the perfect time to go right i should be going above and beyond and actually building my own brand and bringing that to the table you know like even, I, I've, I've been bad at it i need to do more from a social media standpoint but i can guarantee i've brought revenue from the social media few thousand that I've kind of like grown up like it's without a doubt and Jamie's done the same with his his few thousand he's brought money into the business from his marketing there's no doubt about it um and so it's definitely an asset yeah 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 I mean you know don't want to make it sound so much like an echo chamber because I completely agree you know at the end yeah. of the day personal brand growth is so important um but it's what I, it's what I do I, you know I dedicate a lot of my time in the evenings when I finish work to like putting out content um social media posts twitter linkedin i do a lot of it a lot of it when you do it on brand accounts um on the endpoint accounts and the endpoint channels it can it comes off as marketing yeah. and that's why it turns people off because people can read an ad from a mile away uh which is why the best adverts are the ones that don't feel like adverts um but when i put something out on a personal channel where it's me having a one-on-one -on -one connection with an audience and saying like this is what we're doing people engage with it people enjoy it people don't realise Endpoint exists who aren't potentially you know super into esports but no there are phases and there are optics and the liquids but might not know a little team from Sheffield they're from a local area and they're learning about what we're doing uh, some guy commented the other day saying he didn't even know there was a boot camp space in Sheffield well there you go now you do and now you have someone to rally behind and support from a, from a fan perspective because we have the organisation above it that owns it so yeah I'm just circling back to the personal brand growth stuff. Yeah, it's a lot of work and a lot of effort, 100%. Editing always is. Uh, copywriting for LinkedIn and Twitter. But, you know, for starters, the dopamine rush you get from, you know, having a successful post and things is great. Yeah. And um, the connections it brings you down the line are invaluable, whether it's future career stuff or whether it's just bringing people in at the moment, you know, when we post a video on LinkedIn or on TikTok. 
of projects we're working on at Pratt Rooms. Like Pete said, if one person comes in and sees it who spends 10k on a boot camp, it's worth its weight in gold because it took us so little, such little time to make. I would, I would just say that social media is not for everyone, so don't feel like you have yeah. to do it. But if you don't want to do social media, then start building connections. Be LinkedIn, I know that's social media, but you don't have to post. Just start start building your connections, go meet people, say hello at events. ESI is a great event for business connections. I think there's a student one as well. Um, you know, go make your connections if you don't want to do social media, because connections at the end of the day are also everything. So it, I, I hate the saying, you know, it's who you know, but it, it, it is yeah. actually just that, so uh, a lot of the time. Having those connections help with future things, even yeah. if you don't know it. Or just for advice, like someone to reach out to you for advice, like saying, I'm, I'm thinking of doing this, and you know someone who, who you actually trust it will give good advice. I'll add to that, actually. Really Lo- loads of people will give you that advice for free. But well, I, obviously, Pete and Adam were very keen on having a very open recruitment system for my initial job when I started a social media intern back in the day. Um, but I'd already met Adam, and we already knew each other, and he gave me the heads up that we're putting this job up. Um, keep an eye out and obviously I mean if I wanted to I could have sent him on my application I'm sure he would have given me some tips and feedback and I can I can comment and vouch but they did go through a whole recruitment process it wasn't just let's give Jamie the job instantly there was like nine people I believe and then we whittled that, that down there was hundreds of them yeah there was yeah, like 217 yeah. people applied for the job and they got that down to like the final 10 which I was one of and then that came down to like final two which I was again one of so there was a whole process around that and obviously I got I had to prove myself as worthy of it but having that connection early on where Adam took the time to meet with me and say like, what do you want out of us? What can we get out of you? And what is mutual benefit? If I didn't have that connection with Adam, then my recruitment with, M- with an endpoint would have been possibly drastically different. Yeah. So even if we don't know it's gonna affect us in the future, exactly. genuine yeah. respect for our people in the any community whatsoever. It was like two months downtime between me meeting Adam and me starting for endpoint or maybe even three months downtime. Um, so, you know, I had no idea that I was going to end up in that position later down the line, but having that connection 100% was helpful. Yeah. A, lot, a lot of it is just timing as well. I say with like, if you're trying to get sponsorship contracts and you reach out to a brand and, and they say, oh, we've got no budget right now. But if you'd been lucky enough to maybe email them two weeks ago, they might have gone, oh, we do have budget at the moment. Yeah. We hadn't just spent it. And a lot of it's just timing, but it, you've just got to put yourself in the right spot when the timing is right. So I've explained that badly, but, you know, if, if you're not... If you don't play your, if you don't put your chips in the middle, you will never win. But if you actually try and play the thing and actually make sure you're available when the right timing is right, you never know. But if you're not actually there in the first place, you you, you won't you miss out yeah. on opportunities. So it's kind of um, always take yeah. a little bit of risk as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not? So you, we mentioned that obviously Sheffield-based organisation and like looking at like the marketing and everything, you, it is very much you're, you're proud to be in Sheffield. Is is there a reason why you care about putting that you're from Sheffield in a lot of your marketing and social media and things like that? Like, why why do we love the city so much? Uh, my business partner was was born and bred here, basically, um, and yeah, I think from, from our perspective, we do see. Well, we, we love the city for start. I've moved up here full time now as well. I'm yeah. fully fully living in Sheffield, and I, I love it. And I think that there's a lot of clubs in London that are trying to do it. There's loads of money in it, all this kind of stuff. We 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 we're South Yorkshire, Sheffield, love it. Let's let's get the let's let's try and build some fan base around here from that yeah. uh, from that area. Um, I don't see why not be proud of it. The same as like football, you're proud of your kind of like region. Let's see if we can put Sheffield on the map. And I can tell you, we definitely are in a number of areas. Yeah. Be it esports or even from a Prakram's perspective, we've got people boot camping with us from Brazil, Peru, China, uh, everywhere in Europe. Um, America. North America, like we've, we've Australia. actually we, Australia. If we had a scratch map, map right now, we pretty much would have covered nearly the whole of the world almost in the first year. It's kind yeah. of crazy. Yeah. Everyone going like, who, "What's this little place called Sheffield?" And um, and and actually coming here and loving it. And I think that's great. Um, but yeah, so so it's, it's for us. For us, it's, uh, it's where we are. Our headquarters are based in Sheffield. We're actually you know ten minute walk from you guys. Yeah. And um, and why not be proud of that as well? I think yeah. Yeah, I think that, I think it is very important to be proud of things like that as well yeah and just on the other side of things here so coming from obviously top dogs at the company here um what is like your ideal marketing partner or a sponsor that you might want like in, in the ideal world one of each or yeah one i, each, I say yeah. from esports is in a tough place where it can be hard to get um for a brand to see I mean, it's hard saying this, obviously, if you're trying to sell it, but it can be hard for a brand to see um, an ROI if you're 
going based off here's a link click it and go buy something yeah. and I think it's probably the same for Sheffield United a lot of the partnerships that work better are ones where they want to get their brand out there as brand exposure and like brand recognition is where esports really really thrives so finding partners that understand that is a really good part of marketing and they can do the click through rates through Google or, or face, Facebook and they can hit a younger demographic through um, through esports and have that kind of um, and have, have that brand exposure to esports and, and people understand that is, is the perfect partner but someone who actually works with you not that you just stick a logo on, on, your, on your jersey someone who actually tries to work with you on putting their own money into create good media fun stuff you know we went paintballing with or, or BB gunning with a, an organisation last year who did that for some of their content creators and great fun uh, create some media out of it we have a really good relationship with that helps us want to go that extra mile for them as well because we know they're good people behind the, behind the business and yeah yeah I guess touching upon that, you know, specific regards to ROI, I think the big thing for me is uh, fast moving consumer goods are the way to go. If you can get something that is easy to sell, uh, that people can afford, yeah. and it doesn't have a large, um, what I'm looking for escapes me, customer acquisition process. Like, for example, a gaming chair, a gaming PC, a huge purchases like four to a thousand pounds, even more than a thousand pounds for a PC. You have to think about it a lot. You do a lot of research into it, um, and you have a lot of a lot of different companies out there providing a similar service. So things that are quick, easy to purchase, that young people, because our demographic is a lot of like sort of, I want to say 13 to 13 to 30, yeah? Somewhere around that ballpark. Uh, especially on the younger end, we don't have a lot of disposable income, so something that they can easily acquire. Things like that. I can't think of a brand off the top of my head that sort of fits that bill. Um, but a lot of what I do, particularly with sponsorships, um, is a lot of uh, a lot around Pratt Room, so our boot camping brand. We have hundreds of to cut thousands of pros come into the facility every year that get a hands-on experience of products. So anything also that we can give them that they can show off without being a brand risk to their own organization um, is great. So Red Bull get a lot out of having their product in our office because they're in a lot of our broadcasts. So for example, if we're having a Blast event on, in the background of all the Blast um, player cams, you can see Red Bull fridges uh, and Red Bull products, which is you know, uh, unconscious brand, uh, unconscious marketing for them because they're just having a can in their hand, drinking away, not completely oblivious to the fact that they're doing a great favor for us. Yeah. Uh, they get a benefit out of it because they get free energy drinks, and we get a benefit out of it because Red Bull want to work with us. So win-win for everyone's situation. Yeah. I, I would say actually just on that as well, though, it's more important that the product's actually good because you don't want to work with yeah. a brand where, yeah. let's say, you're doing headsets and you you work with the worst brand of headsets, then you're flogging something which your pros don't believe in your influencers don't believe in it we don't believe in it but you're just getting money from it that never works long term either yeah so trying to working with the best brand in a certain sector is is super important as well to us but yeah, yeah. is there any like big companies out there that you what you wish to sponsor with like partner up with in the future yorkshire tea <laughs> we're yorkshire why not that's a good one yeah i mean people keep on saying that i don't drink tea so i'm not a tea i don't drinker. either I yeah. think it's like, it i'm not like a brand, yeah. i mean i know dunkin donuts work with um Falcons in Saudi Arabia. Um, I would love to work with like Dunkin' Donuts or a fast food product be because good. everybody, or like for us especially, like Uber Eats and delivery partners, just the food hub a delivery, delivery partner would be great. Delivery partner would be amazing because yeah. our players, like a little bit of inside information here, like we average team that comes to spend a week boot camping from a tier one org spend seven grand on food. Wow. In, the, in the time they're with us, like two, two, like a two, <laughs> a like a two to three week boot camp, yeah. So yeah. maybe one week's a little bit too, but like a two to three week boot camp, yeah. the average spend because they're spending seventy to eighty pounds per player per day on food, um, which is just a crazy amount of it's crazy probably, amount of money. Grand a week on that, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh no, I did the calculation. I worked it out. I said it. To, I broke it down yeah. for a particular. I won't name which one, but an actual food partner we had a meeting with. Yeah. We broke down exactly how much we were spending on food on their delivery service. So their budget cook their own food which yeah is exactly for as well, but, this yeah. particular team was uh, about fifty dollars per per person per day food budget and they wow. were spending 24 days something like that with us so when you broke that down mathematically it came out at like yeah, six crazy. seven k something like that a crazy amount so, of money so a lot of money so yeah we have we've got the facilities to cook like pete says yeah. people don't do it because it's convenience and delivery is just in sheffield is insane yeah so talking about like actual specific games now what games are you like your, your team is good at at the minute like what are you top top class at, at the minute yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean you know the one we started out in where Pete's and Pete and Adam's heart lies is obviously Counter-Strike um, very deep in the core of Endpoint and the community that they've built in in, in Counter-Strike 
Um, Counter Strike is a very hard game to be good at. It costs a lot of money to have a top team, and Pete will probably allude to that a little bit more when he when he speaks in a second. Um, right now, our Rocket League team is doing pretty well. We recently signed a new team after having a bit of a year of bad luck with 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 signings. Um, they've come out, done a really good job in the first split. Not obviously to the point we made it to a major, unfortunately, but we've gone, we've gone from being under the top 12 somewhere what we were like we were well, top we were 16 seven, we were 16 or 17 last season. yeah we were, we were like now, yeah. we we're barely in the top 16 now we're in the top 10 I think we we're 8th or ninth overall right now in, in points in Europe, yeah. in Europe. Yeah. Um, which, is, which is which is good obviously we want to be better than that but they're doing a good job so hopefully we'll be uh, when's this podcast going out? oof I'm not too maybe two weeks time okay so with the acquisition of a new player um, hopefully they do a really good job um this this split I'll let Pete talk more about Counter Strike because this is this is baby right there <laughs> we also have Quake as well so anyone who's a bit older listening Quake is a great game it's also free to play so yeah. I recommend you go play it it's 1v1 one, one one. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah Counter Strike Quake and Rocket League I mean I don't need to say more than what Jamie said already but uh, we also have a community um, hub for Counter Strike where we've got 50,000 members in there as well uh, for the UK and Ireland so if you like Counter Strike get involved it's free to play any skill levels we've got different you know things that people can play with so from if you on a platform called Face It, level zero or level one to ten to pro, we've got full path to pro route there, and we scout within that as well. It's good for us. And yeah, is there any games that you wish you could get into in maybe in the near future? Yeah, yeah, we're looking, <laughs> we're, we're, we're looking at one game maybe, but esports is such a money pit that you have to make sure that you get the right games and have the right strategy to go around it. That we've kind of put our money in other places first, and also you can kind of fragment your fan base sometimes if you go into too many games because yeah. someone might like Counter Strike but then they might also like they might not uh, but they might like not like Rocket League same wise so you kind of split your fan base in half sometimes Yeah. some people will follow you for everything which is a great fan obviously but every fan is just as good as each other but the other games we're looking to maybe Fortnite just because it's we, they're owned by Epic Games we've got a good relationship with them from Rocket League there's some really cool things you can do right now with um, UEFN where you can create maps and yeah. game and uh, I feel like from a creative standpoint if we're looking to do more media with it I feel like Fortnite's got some good opportunities but we're not there yet and a lot of it's financing it as well and, and finding the right partners to do it with and yeah yeah so just coming to a close of the podcast at the minute where do you see Endpoint in five years time hopefully in the, in the good picture well at the moment we keep spinning off new brands we've got five companies right now so I'm, I, I want to grow those companies now instead of keep spinning off more but um, yeah as just a group of, of esports as a whole some of our other other businesses are quite focused so, like count, e, Endpoint itself from esports is focused on specific games and pros for us some of our other businesses are focused on the esports market as a whole so we like Bratcombs will have Dota teams and uh, League of Legends teams and Rainbow Six and Rocket League has every game basically so it's kind of just telling that story, growing as a brand and um, hopefully have a really good following, especially locally, like getting Sheffield people behind us will be great. Um, being something good for the community, growing more staff base, you know, actually providing jobs in the area and kind of, um, yeah, just, and having a having a fun place to work really, something that people actually enjoy going to. That's all that me and Adam want to care about as well, is we want to have, we want to enjoy what we're doing, otherwise what's the yeah. point? Yeah. So, you know, we wouldn't be doing this we're not doing this for the money we're doing this to enjoy it so you know hopefully in the future but yeah I think um, five years time just keep growing it like the, the sky is the limit for these things I think yeah yeah so one final question for you both if you could look back at your 15 16 year old self what what would you tell him what would what were the main things you could tell him um why do I have to go first <laughs> I've been talking a while <laughs> um I tell my 15, 16 year old self I mean I would give myself all point as I raised with other students and things now earlier because when I was 15, 16 when I was 15 I was on the no 16 years old when I quit competing in COD um, I would tell myself probably to quit earlier or back when so I mean I can only speak on COD but when COD was an open system and didn't have franchising yet um, there was a lot more uh a lot more orgs involved there was a lot more jobs involved so I could have been into esports a lot earlier if yeah. I'd have had that route I don't know what you were Call of Duty fans you'll, you'll be able to attest to this but Black Ops 4 was like peak cod um, it was great there were so many organisations involved in it tier 1 orgs involved in it that were uh, had great teams they had entire support systems around them they had staff so you know if I'd have been a bit more on the ball I could have worked my way in there which would have given me 
a, an, easy, a, an easier stepping stone than one might have had. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think 15, 16 years old, no one's held me the route and the things to do I have to take to get to where I am now, uh, which is why I try to help people out and not gatekeep how to get into this industry as you know, like people did for me, um, to younger people. So I would tell myself exactly the same thing as I tell other people, just be proactive and, and work hard and the opportunities will come when you meet the right people. Yeah, I mean, I think I think obviously you have got to tell your future self be proud of what you've done because I think you got to look back. Sometimes it's easy to be in the day to day where you you think oh, I need to get to the next stage, I need to get to the next stage, but sometimes you don't look back at what you've done and where you've come from. And I think that's really I think that's a really good a really good point. I think um, yeah, I, I never have regrets. If you do, if something happens, you've made it in, in that time. And there's, there's sometimes there's hindsight, of course, but I think that. You just got to learn from everything. Everything you do is just a learning, learning kind of curve until you, until you have a, a much larger brain and you know you know what you're talking about in certain areas and or whatever. So yeah, don't have regrets and just um, enjoy yourself and, and pursue what you want to actually pursue. Don't have don't have um, don't be afraid to pursue something. I've got a great one actually to yeah. add to this actually. When you're 15, 16 years old, I mean nowadays it's a lot riskier. But when I was 15, 16 years old, cancel culture didn't exist yet. Yeah. So if I, I would tell my 15, 16 year old self to delete everything off Twitter right now, yeah. <laughs> clean that up immediately, make sure you get everything off of there because they will find it. Yeah. They do. They do. Yeah. They I did. I did. I cleaned everything up. You will not find anything on my social media that could incriminate me in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. All my criminal offences are via vehicles. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so, be careful you do brand-wise. Just to finish this off, we have got the Wheel of Death. So, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Give it a little spin. So there's, there's a few different things on here, from your opinions to my opinions, questions. We also got some velocity. Oh, oh yes, yeah. oh yes. Best video game. Oh, well. <laughs> oh. Counter-Strike quick, done. Counter-Strike, is that... The whole, the, the whole like kind of uh, the whole video game series one. like as in it's gone from you know your beta to 1.1 to 1.6 yeah. all the way through to source condition zero the whole kind of like series of it the whole shebang yeah everything just the 20 the 25 years of Counter Strike great yeah it's brilliant is it both we both got this question no you can get a different question oh, unless no, you want to answer again spin again yeah it's a different question I'm just say cod it's boring <laughs> which cod though ghosts ghosts every day of the week on a Sunday. Recommend oh, oh. <laughs> choi- unpopular food choice. What well, something I that's something, what I didn't want to get because I actually couldn't think of an answer. To that something yet. I something, like something like you might it might it might be a guilty pleasure food or something like that. Oh god, all oh, my food is guilty pleasure foods. <laughs> I don't actually know what I don't feel no guilt. I eat whatever I want. Um, Maybe like some people pineapple on pizza. See my mine at the minute I... is mini cheddars and you know Biscoff the spread. That's yeah. not guilty. That's great. It's, it's yeah, amazing. Sounds, sounds Mini yeah. cheddars and the Biscoff spread. <laughs> it just sounds like a cheesecake. <laughs> it's so good. I wonder, I, I tell, okay, I am a big fan of. Um, they actually make it now, so I don't have to make it myself. But um, chocolate with like salt involved, like putting salt mm. into something sweet, is a great combination. So it, they now make chocolate bars, which have got like chunks of pretzel in them, like salty pretzel. Yeah, Tony's ones. I haven't, no. They're bloody great. The sal- uh, salty chocolate Tony ones. Is they're it, really expensive because it's Tony's yeah, chocolate. Yeah, it's so But it is so good. Is, they, is it Netherlands Tony's chocolate? I feel like it's, they've got a factory in the Netherlands. But like, sure, you got like Cadbury's sure. World fact. Like, anyway, yeah. Besides the point. I love, like, if I don't want to spend a fortune on salted chocolate, I'll just, like, get a tube of Pringles yeah. and get some chocolate and the two short meat in my mouth. <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a good meal, actually, especially with a student. So, it's, um, sure. I, I have this fairly often as a meal and it makes no sense, but it works pasta and you get like a stirring sauce like a pasta sauce of it and then you get um you get frankfurters you get tuna you get sweet corn and you get chorizo and then put it into a bake so you like uh, oh no you don't put it into bake sorry mix all together heat it up and then put cheese on top obviously and it's, it's great it's a nice meal for a student yeah it's really good actually i'm gonna do one more right okay something i learned while we have a load of um dota teams boot camp members at the moment and a lot of them are from the sorry Asian Pacific region, um, a few from China, something like Indonesia. Um, one thing, when I have like instant noodles, I'll just put the instant noodles in a pot with some hot water, usually microwave them, and that's it, done. These guys like take instant noodles to a whole other level. Oh yeah. Like these guys yesterday had got like, like it was chorizo, but it reminded me, they had like chorizo sausages, like cut in half with like fried eggs and like scallions on the, and on like a bed of noodles. I've never seen anything like it. it all I could describe it to you was like, 
an Asian fusion English breakfast. Um, sounds pretty good though. Yeah, I'm gonna say I, it sounds great. I was like, you guys to cook for me. I mean, I've seen the state of a room, so actually, I don't want them to cook for me. Come to think of it, because we uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, no, I, I don't, I'm gonna elevate my noodle game to a whole other level. Yeah, you know, yeah. I've been inspired. Thank you, thank you very much for being on the podcast today. We've very enjoyed this, but yeah, make sure you come back for the next episode, guys. Thank you.